Okay, so how's everybody doing? Thanks for tuning in. So just a couple of things then. Uh, number one, thank you for all the comments from part one, uh, the introduction of Diorama Painting 101. Um, but you know, I'd really love to uh, have all of you in a live classroom. Man, would that be great, you know, because then I could meet all of you in person and uh, it's so much more easier to instruct and teach and share um, what one knows live, you know, but you know, it's things are the way they are right now. So social media seems to be the uh, burgeoning platform with all its caveats as well. And let me also add too, for those that do really fantastic work with just a traditional paintbrush, uh, as I do and use paintbrushes as well. Like if someone took my airbrush away, it wouldn't stop me from painting. I also want to add that you, you can do a lot of this without an airbrush. Uh, you're going to have a difficult time when it comes to airbrushing like trees and small texture and a soft blending, painting grass, you know, uh, painting gravel, like just getting the, you know, that layered controlled filter approach is just really not achievable with a brush. I mean, you can paint rolling stock and trains with a brush. I do it all the time. Uh, as I've demonstrated in earlier content. But for those of you that really want to get into modeling or model railroad or anything, I just want to encourage you, get a cheap airbrush and just shoot it on a piece of cardboard. You know, just get over the fear. Like I have a friend of mine, he's a, a early baby boomer who I just got into the airbrush and he expressed to me that, man, I'm so glad I got into this. I was so scared at first. and. I've, you know, I bought a compressor and airbrush and, and now I'm starting to learn and it's just the, you know, the power of this tool is so great, you know, what can be achieved. And, um, you know, you don't have to be like a Picasso to use an airbrush. You just have to, you just have to be someone with desire, right? Uh, let me just share one thing, a childhood experience that really got me into all of this. When I was like, I think I was still a teenager, I had built a small little four foot by 12 foot railroad diorama. And it had all the buildings on there and a few Bachman cars and the track laid down and and grass and foam sprinkled around. But everything had this sort of separate, you know, distinctive look about it. But, it, you know, there's no continuity. So what I did was, is I just took a bottle of earth, like it was humbral back in the day. And I thinned it way down. I made this like tinted wash, you know, in the, in the older airbrushes with the bottle, you know, the siphon feed ones. And I made this thin, thin, super thin wash of earth. And I just sprayed the whole model down with the rolling stock on it and everything. So everything had this wet look, right? It just looked wet. You couldn't actually see the filter yet. And then when I walked away and it dried and I came back, I was just I almost fell over. I was stunned. I thought, man, that, you know, so that uh, very early on, I learned that the umber tones and earth tones and very, very thin washes is the trick. You know, like I just want to dispel the black art myth of, uh, you know, painting or, or, you know, for those people that hang on to, you know, tricks of the trade or whatever. I knew people like that. And, uh, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, I would give away all my tips all the time because it would compel me to learn more, to keep learning, learning, learning. And uh, the same goes with, uh, you know, our emotional attachments to things. You know, that's another barrier. Oh, I, you know, I don't want to wreck my nice car, you know, well, get a cheap car and just start practicing and you'll have no problem. You'll gain the confidence to do any car or any locomotive eventually, right? There's a couple of preliminary things I have to do first. I want to mix the color and show you how I do it. And then I want to just mention something here about this little outhouse. Remember that? A little further back in the content, I'll show you how I'm gonna paint that so well let's get that out of the way first so what I did here was is I just took some of the rail brown really thin right and nothing fancy I just took a brush and I just stabbed the whole thing over with rail brown like let this all happen like see this little little variances there in the tone you know just from the brush darker there lighter here the white showing through that's what I want, right? Just a rough, thin, sloppy looking, uh, you know, rail brown umber coat, right? 
And then with the airbrush, we're going to dust it over with this blue. Because these are commonly blue, right? And then we'll dust the roof with white. And that's it. Like the airbrush part takes seconds to do, really. What you can do with an airbrush. Okay, so airbrush will save you time and money. How does it save you money? Well, it extends your paint. Your paint will go for miles and miles and miles. Just beyond what you would do straight from a bottle with a brush. Okay, so when you get these little bottles, let me point out, this, like this used to be the original bottle. And this really bugged me because... I mean, look at the size difference. You know, anyway, back in the day, Tamiya came in these, and they shrunk down to these. All right. It's all about money in the end. But anyway, I keep all my bottles. I clean them all in isopropyl cup, like a yogurt cup, where I clean them and reuse them, because these are excellent, solid bottles, right? They don't break. The caps do sometimes, but these are great for mixing colors, right? So this is what we're going to mix our color in for the building flat. Now, let me point out this, too. And white, by the way, when you go to the hobby shop, make sure you leave with a, net with a bottle of white because you'll use lots of it. See the inside there? Like, look at that, eh? You think, what a ripoff, you know? I mean, in a way, it's, it kind of is. Like, come on, you guys. Like, fill the bottle, would you? I mean, they all come like that, just above half. But anyway, all the pigments on the bottom, right? It's like half of, or maybe one-third. And like I said, the, if you thin this with isopropyl, man... Does it ever go far, this pigment, when you're using thin coats? So I basically start by mixing the uh, the paint right, like right default from new first, right? Get that paint all on the bottom, all that pigment, get it all suspended nice in the medium, which is a Tamiya medium, but it's it's the same as this or similar, same thing. It's just it's just a carrier. Okay, so then I have this half bottle of rich, opaque white, right? And then I almost always, you know, because there's space in there and air, and I really, really shake it up good, right? Get her, get her really mixed in really good there. Okay. And then what I'll often do is, is I'll just top off the bottle with uh, isopropyl alcohol. Now there's there's half there's there's five bucks worth of Tamiya thinner. There's a two pennies of isopropyl. Okay, and then I'll cap it up again. Give her a shake. So we want a really pale yellow, right? So, whoops, you're gonna. I love spilling paint. Anyway, so I'm gonna dump some like half of that in that bottle there. Okay. So wipe that off that rim there. Alrighty, so now we have basically this large bottle with about a third of white in it. Probably way more than we're going to need, right? But this is the reason why we use isopropyl, because then we're not really wasting paint, because you can always thin it down and use it for other tints. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this yellow here. Now I just dump from the bottle. I don't measure things too much, but you can use these. You know, I, I, I pick these up on a whim, these Vallejo pipettes things. I mean... You don't really need them, but if you want, they're okay. Take a bit of paint in there, and I'm going to put a bit of yellow in there, okay? And then what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to shake it up and just have a look and see what it looks like. It's sort of a... I want a banana color. That's what I want, right? Like that. There's a nice banana color, eh? So I'm going to go with that, okay? So I didn't really measure. I just eyeballed it, right? And that's what we're going to use to dust layers onto the um, the XF90 red brown building flat. All right. Okay, so uh, here we are. Then I decided to set up inside the uh, room here, just offset from the layout here. It's um, really difficult to do this kind of thing outside right now. The weather's not so great up here and I'm only going to be shooting a very thin small amounts of paint so I can give, give you the general kind of method and idea behind this. So uh, as you know I got the paint mixed here. It's kind of a banana yellow. Uh, fairly thin as I showed earlier. Um, 
like I say, just thin, 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 right? You can always add a bit more pigment. There's no fixed ratio here. Just I just go by what I feel. You know, there's the color there. It's very milky. So I put a little bit of isopropyl first in the cup, and then I just spray, just lube it up, right? Just lube up the... See how quickly it starts to evaporate there? So anyway, I always have cardboard on hand so I can, you know... Part of the way with the dual action, we say, like, uh, this Traeger effect is really just to clean the tip. Yes, it controls the volume of uh, paint. It's when you press down that controls the air. But it's just basically, the pressure is not controlled by pushing down. It's controlled on the regulator on the compressor, which is why I use a tank, by the way. I don't use the typical airbrush compressor. They're, they make a lot of noise. They create a lot of heat, which creates condensation in the hose and introduces water spots to your paint and that can really ruin your day if you're doing a nice model but anyway and then i just learned to pull back to bring the paint on you can adjust these and run them like a single action two back here you can loosen this and pull it out a little bit and then tighten it down so one flow comes out but that means when you go back to neutral or dump the clutch as in a car with a standard transmission like i explained uh, you're always going to have paint coming out. It's always power coming through. So uh, you want it so when you let go that there's, even when you press this trigger down, it, it's just air, right? And then you just learn, like you'll learn to pressure down and pull back, like to vary the amount of paint. So I got 35 PSI set on the compressor. So I'm going to introduce some of the color here. Okay. And then, uh, what I'm going to do is start going down in an up and down motion, like a little ways away first, okay? Just adding paint like this. Very tiny amounts. So I see what kind of effect I'm getting. Up and down, up and down, up and down, right? Very thin. You can get in close to and slow down and do this. So that's all I'm doing basically is I might even want to thin this paint down more. See how it's a bit sort of particle effect? I might thin it down a bit more. All I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna dump this back into the jar and I'm gonna add Quite a bit more. Good long squeeze there. The CN running across the main crossing there down the road. Okay. Remember how I mentioned about always having a cardboard on the side? Okay, so I can test it. Might want a little bit more pressure. I'm going to put it up to 40 PSI. Okay. Up and down, up and down. Just find a fixed point on the accelerator or the trigger. Don't cover the whole flat right away. Okay. Don't be afraid to stay in one spot a little bit longer than others. See how I'm doing a little bit, even a little bit more darker here where the shadow is going to be behind the tree. So these little areas here, like those are okay. Right? Those are just little anomaly mistakes that you make and you want those to work for you. Stay a little bit longer on, on the flat now, see. Just little thin layers so that you can stand back and look at it, right? 
That's how you do it. You get into a groove after a while, right? There's a big cloud of atomized paint overtakes me here. That's why it's nice to have it outside. But you get the idea, right? And I'll come in a little bit stronger. Leave a little bit of dark on the corner there. Just like that's the trick is just even if you end up with a lot more paint, don't just blow it all on at once. I'll leave some shadow under that, that roof. Hit the door. If you, if you make a mistake, like put a bit too much on like this, or like this, don't worry about it. You know. Sometimes it's those little things that really give the model character. Okay, so that's how I do it. All right, I basically just, you know, I mean, I can even do this while, like this is just straight isopropyl. Watch what it does around here. But look at the right, okay. See what's happening there? All right, so here's some blue. Let me just move this aside. We'll look at this again. We'll revisit it. So I just want to quickly do that. I want to squeeze this in under 10 minutes if I can. So I'm going to add a bit of blue here. I'm going to do the outhouse. Okay. I'm just going to lightly dust. Very light. that little bit against the, the back of the cardboard there. Okay, so I need to throw this in. I don't want to use my airbrush because I have to clean it. For one little part, nah, I'll just paint it with a brush. It's so painful to clean my airbrush. You know what? It can be. But that's why 25 years ago I went with isopropyl alcohol and to me a paint. It's a breeze to clean. Once you blow your paint out or you're done or you dump it back in the bottle, you just take some of this, you can spill it even because you can afford to, right? You just fill that cup up, you pull the needle here, out an inch, half an inch, spray it all through, 
into a box or a wad of paper, stab it with a brush to knock some of it loose, stab the tip, pull the needle, wipe the needle, slide her back in, throw in a little more isopropyl, back and forth a bit. She's clean as a whistle, ready for another paint, ready for another day, right? So if you leave craft paint in here, or even Vallejo overnight, oh boy, you're in for a big, big headache. If you do that with Tamiya, isopropyl alcohol, let it soak for a while, stab around with a knife, start blowing it through, pull the needle, cleans it just like a whistle. This airbrush is, I would, I would say, going on 22 years now. And I use this in the film industry. I build all my models with it. It's the same needle. It's a, uh, I think I mentioned it before, it's an Omni 5000. You can find them online. Best airbrush for the money in the world. I don't care about what you Iwata fans say. I've had lots of Iwatas. They're overrated. Anyway, so there you have it. Isopropyl alcohol, to me, a paint, easy to clean. Okay. Okay, so here we have the building flat in place once again. As you know, everything is wild. Like you can strike it like a mini set, in and out, in and out which is key to developing uh, composition and color, right? As I mentioned in earlier content. So I'm looking at this now and I'm saying, okay, it's, it's getting somewhere. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I gotta go back outside because I gotta really spray a lot and, and uh, run isopropyl cleaning the brush on. I just can't do it in a really tight space like I just showed previously. But I'll be doing the same kind of thing but adding a little more white now just a little bit of uh you know with the little dropper you know add a little half a vial of white then go over it again thin 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 uh toning it down with white again and because i really want a kind of a white beige weathered kind of building front and then when when i throw a wash on it at the very end like a watercolor wash or an oil-based wash which won't attack the base paint um, it's going to change again right and then when the the polarized green window glazing goes in it's going to change it again so uh, i'm going to go outside i'm going to put on another layer by adding white like i just demonstrated and then come back and have another look at it okay okay so uh here we are again and I've now applied uh, three more layers, progressively adding white, and then the fourth layer. And this segment, uh, you can see, let me point this out, where I just went with a pure white, just very light dusting on the tops of the conduits here in the vent. And just down the, where, just trace the conduit with a bit of white. So it just sort of catches, see, so now we've got light. A lot of the umber has gone away, but it's still there in the very tightest recesses, but that'll all get re-enhanced when we put a, a wash, umber wash, raw sienna, raw umber. Uh, we'll decide that later. Um, one other thing I want to mention too is notice the window frame. So what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to quickly mask that off so you'll see the difference. And I'm going to paint the window frame with this XF90 red brown and then a dusting of flat earth. Remember how I talked about the carrying the earth tones up onto the building flat or the buildings? So that's what I'm going to do. And you notice a little outhouse there too, right? Remember it was umber and then I painted it with XF4 blue before I did the, the roof. And then I went in really close with light pressure. And you'll learn that I'll do some more tutorials down the road here on how to get in close and do details. And I finished up the panels on the side with that sky blue. And it's very thin as well, but not as thin as the wash is there. But those are things that you'll, you'll just develop that as you pull your airbrush out every time and you just start doing the practical. All that will come to you. It will come to anyone. You just got to put the time in. There's no parlor tricks. Trust me. It's just put the time in, get that airbrush out and start using it. And uh, it'll empower your painting a hundredfold. Okay, so I'm going to go and do that now and then come back and show you what the window frames look like with the red, brown and the earth. Okay.
Okay, so here's the uh, window frames now painted and I carried some of this color that I use on the track work and the terrain, the earth, the umbers up into the window frame here. That'll help uh, create continuity there as we discussed. And then all the layers have been applied at this stage. Now it looks kind of opaque, but this, you know, this building was a lot like this and so was this car. So we're not quite there yet. Like if you look at the very first picture, I'll just insert one. That's kind of the direction we're going, but now we're going to reverse this process. So we went from dark to light. Remember how I pointed that out with the telephone poles? That philosophy of painting going from dark to light and then light to dark again. Well, that's what we're going to do with this building flat, but we're going to use Vallejo water-based paint, like flood painting, I call it, wet on wet. And it's going to change that building flat again, right? It's going to tie it all in. And then at the end, I'm going to add that polarized, remember I used the clear green to me, I sprayed airbrushed, airbrushed onto uh, the clear. Uh, sheet acetate. I'm going to put a piece of that in behind there and that'll help tie in kind of the grass and the trees that you'll see, right? It'll all make sense in the very end, but it's all process, right? Patiently applying layers. Um, you know, we all want to do things quickly in this ready to run world that we live in, you know, indoctrinated by consumerism. But if we just slow down and approach things and uh, do the, you know, the work and apply the uh, methodology that we develop, you know, well, we end up with something that's unique, right? And that's what you want. Like everybody's intelligent. Everybody has a unique personality. And if you're an artist or a model railroader and you want to express that in your, your layout or your diorama, this is what will happen if you incorporate some of these ideas that I'm sharing with you. That, that's what I want for you. I mean, if somebody doesn't tell you who will, Okay, so, and there's quite a bit more coming up too. Like when we get that done, just let me pan to the right and closing here. Um, the fence is going to get done. I'm going to show you how to pick out those planks. And then I might revisit a little bit the grain elevator. I'm not really sure yet because there's a new layout and in, in being planned and that'll get transferred probably, but we'll see. And then there's down this corner here, there's work to be done down there. Like I want to do... Uh, some tutorials on that building painting and then that little addition office space and then how I'm going to merge the backdrop photo uh, with the uh, 3D foreground and then um, you know I have lots of things I want to do and show like even how I do the trees and um, some other uh, features on the layout okay so uh, I just want to give a shout out to all my uh, latest subscribers and all the ones from the beginning thank you very much for your support this channel wouldn't be possible without you it would lose momentum and uh, I, you know, I mean I would probably trickle things in but because you're all so supportive and I really appreciate your comments I want to uh, keep producing content for you to try to make us all better modelers right okay so um, we'll see you on the next episode and I hope you have a great day